Hey, so this is a tutorial on how to use Abrosaw Phantomorph. I'm using Deluxe Edition version 5 to achieve a morphing effect on the same image. So what that looks like is something like this. So the specific feature that I'm pointing to on this tutorial is see how the rainbow is moving and see how the background behind this crown is moving. Those are the type of morphing features I'm talking about. Now all the other layers that are starting to appear, like the light glowing, those are things that I will, I've will i added in After Effects after I've done the morphing in Phantom Morph. And I'm going to actually show, I'm going to do another tutorial um, that shows how to use layered digital artwork. This is actually from an original um, I think oil painting, oil or acrylic painting by Amanda Sage. I just happened to be working on this and thought it had some interesting features that I could share with you about how to use this software on a more basic level. And then, yeah, I'll get to a more detailed tutorial on how to use digital layers and build that up. But again, this is just about the morphing of uh, the morphing feature on a singular image. So I'm going to actually, I can show you. Yeah, so this video here. This is what it looks like before any other effects have been applied. So it's only showing you the morphing features of this background. And there's not a lot I did on this one for the morphing, but it, you know, you can still see you can still see those features. So at least you know what we're working with. Okay, so when you first open Phantom Morph, so when you first open it, you're gonna get this prompt, create a new project. I would say just skip that because the simplest thing to do is to have your desktop view, just have the workstation open like this. And then on the left-hand window, there's this little file open icon. Click that. Find the image you want to work from that is in the original resolution. So this might sound a bit contradictory at first, but you want to you want to be able to export from the highest resolution. So import the highest resolution file you want to work from. In this case, it's 4K, 4,000 pixels on the largest dimension. Um, and then we're going to change that um, to be working in a lower resolution, but then you can export in a higher resolution. So I'll show you what that means. So I'm going to say open. Um, you can see here on the, on the uh, information that it is uh, 4,000 pixels tall. I'm going to open that. And then you're going to get this prompt that says the image is large. Do you want to make it smaller for better performance? And I'm going to say yes. So here it is on the left hand window. And since we're morphing the same image on the right hand window, you're going to click the file folder open icon. And now this time you're going to bring in the smaller version of it. So I've got a stack here just because I worked on this project in a few different versions. Um, I'm going to choose S5. This is the one it made for us um, automatically to reduce the file size. So it's 807 by 1080. And I'm going to say open. So now you can see in the information bar that these are the same size image. And the reason for doing this is just it's a bit more fluid for working in the lower resolution. You can work in the high resolution. Obviously, it kind of depends on your system that you're working on. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead for a second, but I'm going to come back to this feature. So the what you can do when you're exporting is by the time you're done working on it, you can actually just replace these files with the higher res image. So I can just bring this in. Um, and now when it gives me this prompt, I'm going to say no. And see how in the info bar, it's the larger image, but this one's the smaller image. But because they are actually the exact same image, you know, it'll translate just fine. But when you're exporting, you're going to make them both the higher res image um, so that you make sure you're exporting the highest resolution. And again, I'll come back to that after I show you some of the other features. But it's just so you know how you're working to make sure you're exporting the highest resolution. Before I jump into the project that I've already been working on, just to show you some of the basic features in the preview window, which is the one down on the bottom, uh, you're going to want to turn off this auto reverse and you're probably just going to want this looping auto loop one turned on with these two little green dots here. Um, and then as far as tools, your basic tools here are 
um, your dots or nodes is what I call them. So the plus feature gives you a little pencil that you can start dropping in these nodes. And you can kind of think of them as like pins. So you're pinning an area on the picture. And what I like to do before I start is I actually go around the edge and drop in a bunch of pins just to frame it so that the edge isn't moving and getting all wobbly. Um, your other tools, uh, well, if you make a mistake, there's the minus, and so you can just, it gives you this little thing, and you can see it flash, and you can just take them out. You can use the arrow tool to select a bunch, and then just press delete and remove them. Um, of course, the magnifying feature, the zoom out, zoom in, hand, pretty basic features um, for doing this kind of stuff. So before I get to the other project also, I just want to show you how... Um, how it's important to really think about how you want the movement to go on your image. Uh, so when I go back to this video, you can see how the rainbow is morphing and it's not affecting the other lines that are overlapping it. It is in this area by the head a little bit. It's tweaking it because this isn't layered and so I'm going to have to deal with that later in After Effects by masking it out in a kind of way. Same with this area above the crown. See how it's morphing but it's not affecting these lines? And that's what I wanted to show you because it just working with the detail of these nodes will give you some ideas of how you can use them in other projects. So, so some of the other morphing softwares, it gives you the ability to mask out certain areas, like with a brush, so you can do large masking. This one doesn't, so you actually have to like think about it and pin down certain areas that you don't want to move. So for example, I showed you the edge. Um, if I was doing, you know, if I'm doing the rainbow, I'm gonna, and I don't want the neck to move with it, I'd pin out that all this area you know, that I don't want to move these leaves and everything, kind of make a surrounding border, do them pretty tight, you know, like you can probably see how, how tight they are. So often what happens with people I see on these, these uh, morphing programs is you end up getting a lot of things blurring together. And that's because people aren't really using detailed masks and trying to control which areas are morphing and which aren't. So for example, if I start moving these nodes along the neck, see when I'm touching them, they kind of flash and then they also flash over in the right hand side and it's vice versa. So you wanna move them in this right hand side window. So if I just start moving these out, okay, so if I start moving this, see how it stays put on the left hand side? So this is the movement um, and just gonna move this arbitrarily and this one and this one and this one and then you're gonna see in the preview window down at the bottom here what that looks like pretty sloppy and so obviously did a horrible job there but you know it's to show you what not to do um, because again had I masked out this area and only been working on the rainbow that wouldn't have happened but I want to show you the also the importance of pinning down certain areas before you start to do any movement. And you kind of have to consider this for the whole image, like mask out areas you don't want to move. And by masking out, I mean like put down pins on borders of areas you don't want to move before you start moving anything. Because if you start put, if you do that and you put down pins in an area that you've already moved, what'll happen is it'll guess for you. So I'm gonna use the fingertips as an example here. So when I put a node on this fingertip over here on the left-hand screen, see how it did this weird thing where it put it way down here? Like, what's that all about? Sometimes it works out for you, but you know, I'm gonna put one on the other fingertip. Oh, look, it's way down here on the right. So that's not gonna work at all. Um, totally janky, don't do that. So really try and th think about what you want to move before you start moving things. Okay, so to make that point, this is the uh, working file for this project. And you can see as I'm zoomed out, there's all these clustered areas of nodes. I'm gonna zoom in here a bit now to show you what I worked on. So I pinned the area around the neck and the hands. I'm gonna press play in the preview and you can just see 
a bit closer up of some of the areas that I did morph. You can see some morphing on the neck, a little bit around the mouth, and the rainbow. So as far as the speed of things, um, typically when you start a project, so it's in the menu movie length, it's going to be set to 15 frames per second. I typically leave it at that while I'm working, but if you want to change it while you're working, just change it. Anyway, you can work however you want to see it. I like this one because it's just easy, the 15 frames per second. I can see the movement really quickly. I can see what's happening, and then I can change that later. So in terms of placing these nodes, the reason I wanted to show you this specific project file is because, again, on this rainbow, you can see how the radial lines going out, these yellow beams coming out, aren't really affected by the morph. And that's because I... I put the nodes right along them and then moved them in this right hand side. I moved them along those lines so that no morphing actually, you know, it uses them essentially as a guide and they aren't affected. So I'm going to show you another feature, which is um, from the menu. If you go view morph track or command M on uh, Apple in the preview window, you see all these little red nodes. And if I were to zoom in, whoops, you can see um, how some of them have like a uh, like a, a line on them. That's showing the direction that they're going. So on the hand here, in this right hand side window, it's kind of weird because it doesn't show you in the same window. You know, some of the other softwares, it's only one window, but I, I like the detail of this one with these nodes compared to some of the other softwares, and that's why I'm using this one. I think it has some of the best export features and ability to do detail. Um, so anyway, if I were to move this node on the hand, see how see how it's showing me the preview of what's going to happen? That's also because in the timeline here, that's a good feature to note too, is that like click this along so you can see where you're at. Like if it's at the end, you're not going to see it preview the motion, but see how if it's like partway through, I can see um, what's happening here and that it shows the direction of that node. So again, on the rainbow, and it's hard to tell because the lines are yellow, but that's what I did is I just moved these nodes along these radial lines so that it's not affecting anything else except again in this area, you can see how it's like blurring these details because it can't figure out how to morph those together because they're all random and overlapping. And this type of thing can be solved in other ways if you want to separate layers, but I also masked things out in After Effects after. So I'm going to move to a different part of the image here and show you um, how to make sure you're doing detailed uh, morphs on specific objects. So let's pause this and I'm going to Command M so you don't see the motion track. So this little spiral here, uh, see how it's moving and it's not really affecting anything else. This is that same thing about basically masking out certain areas. Okay, so I'm zoomed in here and you can see this spiral morphing and it's basically fitting together, you know, each spiral is sort of morphing into the next one above it, but it's not really affecting too much on the outer, on any of the areas beside it. And that is because, now when I go back to the nodes, um, I've masked out these other areas. So I've put nodes all along in the areas that I don't want to move and I haven't touched them. And I did that again. I did that before I started doing the motion on this to make sure that those other areas outside of it didn't move. Just another example of that on the top here. See how it's morphing, but it's not affecting these radial lines because with the nodes, I only moved them, I placed them upon these radial lines so that it looked as though the background is just morphing behind it. But again, these aren't separated layers. And this, again, this can be solved when you have a digital file and you have separate layers. But this is when you're working with a flat image um, and you need to try and mask things out. And sometimes you'll need to have different files for, you know, what you're working on where you might actually morph certain areas and then on one project and then actually do a whole other project and then combine them in something like After Effects later. But yeah, that's a basic basic tutorial on how to use the basic node features and morphing. Um, yeah, so when it comes to exporting, 
Uh, now that I've worked on this, I'm done what I want to do. I want to export it. Now I need to swap this image with the higher resolution file. So I go back to open it, go to the original file. That's 4,000 pixels. Open it. Now with this prompt, I say no because I want the bigger image there. And see how now in the info bar, it's changed and it's that higher res image, but all the nodes are still in place. And now I have to do this with this other file here. Okay, so now they're both the high res file. And when I press play, it's good to go. Okay, so the next thing you need to double check after swapping the images for the high res file is go to movie, size, and even if it's checked on the high res image file, just click it again because sometimes it, it's weird. It like hasn't fully registered for the export. So that size, same as image one, click that. Okay, there you go. And uh, then also regarding the length, this is where I'd change it again. So it was at 15. I was off camera, change it to 30. So this is where it was. Change it back to 30 so that it's going to be a one second loop at 30 frames per second. If I wanted it longer, I think I already said this, but like if you want it to be two seconds, give yourself 60 frames per second and then you can time remap it however you want. Just gives you a bit more to work with. So this one I'm going to do 30. And then down here is the export button. This little movie reel, see that uh, came up there, the little indicator. So for flat images, I, I choose image sequence export. Um, it's a smaller file size to have archived on your computer. And I actually think for Phantom Morph, it works better, like the output is better. Whereas if you choose something like a QuickTime movie, for some reason there can be glitches. I haven't used AVI movie much because it also hasn't produced the best results. However, QuickTime Movie comes into play when you're using layers and especially transparent layers. And that's a whole other thing I got to get into on another tutorial because it's a bit complicated how that works, how to restack those layers in After Effects. But yeah, for this tutorial, I would choose image sequence, flat image, um, JPEG quality 100%, um, export, and then you just choose, you know, make sure you have it in a organized folder where you're working, you know, this original project from, but make sure you choose another folder to export the JPEGs into and name it, um, put the little hyphen at the end um, of your file name. So this one I would put, uh, so I'll just do it for the sake of this. I'll say um, tutorial exports. And then I would you know, so tutorial underscore one, then I'd put another underscore because after that is where the numbers are going to come in um, for the for the image sequence. See how this is in the preview window here. It's 01, 02, all the way up to 30. Otherwise, the number gets stacked on the end there and it looks kind of weird. So I'm going to say save and it's going to do its little process there. Okay, great. So for wh for whatever reason, when it's done, it just shows you like a preview of one image. But then if I were to go to the file, um, here it is. Here's all the, the image sequence that you can just then import into whatever video editor you're using as an image sequence, and it'll come out as a one second thing that you're going you're gonna to loop. So I'll just quickly show you what that looks like now. OK, so now I'm in After Effects, which is where I combine my files and add other layers to them. So I've created a composition where at the bottom is the image sequence from frame one to 30. Okay. And it's the full resolution. It's the full, um, full 4k image file. So when I preview that, you can see the basic motion that I did there. And I'm not sure how well this is going to show up on the tutorial, but you might see there's like a weird little flash at the end of it. And this is something about Phantom Morph. I've had this on some of those other apps where they're just weird little glitches and it doesn't always happen. Some images it does, some it doesn't. You can try exporting it again or a different format. This one, it just wanted to do that every time. Um, so what I did was actually added the original image, um, masked out the area that seemed to be flashing. So as I zoom in here, see how it pops? There's like this weird little glitch. Um, so I masked that out and put in this original image. So now when I preview it, see, it's not doing that weird little flash. 
And then I also added an adjustment layer because I felt like the colors were just a little bit off from the original image. So this is just the one second loop. Now I have another um, sequence here. So I've this is a it's composition with all these stacked layers. And then I've made another composition that's six seconds of this one second stack. So because I want to then work in um, more layers after, but I know that I want it to be like approximately a six second loop that I'm working with. And so this composition, I've made it into a sequence. If you're starting from scratch, would look like this. You'd you'd drop in this um, the composition that you want to sequence and you duplicate it however many times you want to. Grab them all, right click, Kimi Frame Assistant, Sequence Layers. And this is a feature, so sometimes I want to overlap them by like two frames, two or three frames, and you say dissolve front layer. I don't always do this because some images with this morphing technique actually look okay to have those end frames blended together, and some don't. Some you actually want to blend three flame frames together, and it's just weird. It's a trial and error thing. So in this case, I did that. And so now you can see these layers are sequenced. And now I have this other composition to work with. And then here's, you know, I'm not going to go into too many details on this specific tutorial, but this is where I start building up all those other layers to get to the to the other light effects. I'll just show you another preview of what that looks like. So again, this was the final of adding more layers. So beyond the morphing, and this is a build up over 30 seconds actually. So these light layers start coming in more and more as the sequence evolves. So I think that pretty much covers it for this tutorial. Um, yeah, I hope you got something out of it. I'm new to making tutorials, so hopefully I'll be more organized next time. But um, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know.